And welcome to the live stream. Let me know if I'm coming in clear through this microphone. Let's see, let's see here. All right, this is Ramsey Dewey coming to you live from Shanghai, China, the People's Republic of China. I've had a... T yeah, if you're not familiar, am I one punch man? Um, no, but thanks to comments like that, I learned who One Punch Man is. Haven't seen the show, but I did a little digging and research. All right, Crow Guy 132 says, Ramsey, hope you're having a good day. You too, my friend. So again, let me know if we have any uh, issues with the sound or the video. I'm getting a buffering signal on my screen right here, so I'm not sure if the video is coming through. Please let me know. All right. Wow, already got a bunch of questions coming through. Did I watch Ip Man? Yeah, I saw the first one and the second one. My friend Anthony, Anthony, he's uh plays the referee in Ip Man 2. And there's a flashback in um Yeah, it's buffering on your side too. There's a flashback in that in Ip Man 4, which I haven't seen yet, featuring Anthony, and he didn't even know he was in the movie. So Alright. So I've had a ton of questions about the coronavirus. I don't want to uh, get too deep into that if this is buffering, though. Yeah, 362 deaths so far. That sounds about right. That is consistent with the, the numbers I've heard. Now... Yeah, there's been a lot of... Uh, a lot of panic, a lot of fear-mongering about this situation. Um, that's the problem with news media, I think, is that it's very much the fear-mongering industry. Yeah, this is a, uh, a tragic thing when anybody dies a horrible death like that, but um, at the same time, I think those of us who survive have the responsibility to not panic. Anyway. Both picture and sound are crystal clear here in CZ. Okay, cool. Are right, you can see me properly? Excellent. I'm still getting the buffering signal on my screen. All right. We have a question from our friend Mohammed. Butterfly guard versus closed guard in MMA. Yes. All the different guards, different applications. You'll use them in different situations. So it's not train one or the other. It's train both of them. So, all right, the audio and the video are matching now. All right, good. All right. Our friend Corey says, hey coach, love your stuff. Any advice on getting off your back when someone heavy holds a tight side mount or side control? I made a video about that. It's, it's really little things that you have to do to make spaces. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an old video, but uh, still very applicable about how, how to get the cross face under your opponent's head without giving up your arm. And uh, once you can do that, you can start to make little spaces. Because, yeah, fighting a bigger guy is very much a game of making little spaces when you're getting squished. Okay, so again, I've had hundreds, maybe about a thousand questions about the coronavirus, so I'll, I'll, we'll get into the, uh, the MMA questions in just a bit. But yeah, just an overview of it. Um, oh man, we got a super chat about Stephen K. Hayes. Was that the ninjutsu guy? I'm not really familiar with Stephen K. Hayes, so I don't know a whole lot about him, to be honest. I, I think I think you wrote a book about ninjutsu. I, I didn't read it. I don't know much about it, so sorry sorry about that. Um, but yeah, man. The karate nerd came to China. He should have come to train with you so that he actually could actually learn something. I, I love Jesse, Jesse the karate nerd. He's cool, man. But yeah, I would have that would have been great if he stopped by to say hi. So, unfortunate. But what, what's happening in China right now? Let's get straight back to that here. Um, it's, the situation is evolving. It's, it's progressing, man. Oh, wow, super chat from the Orsade Pugilist. 
Thank you so much. He says, love your work. Keep it up. Love your comments, my friend. So here in Shanghai, um, a couple weeks ago, nothing was really go on, going on except Chinese New Year. And th this is an interesting thing. If you've never been in China, if you've never been in mainland China during Chinese New Year, oh man, you would be kind of shocked if you showed up here for the first time. Because... Shanghai, one of the biggest cities in the world, the largest city in China with an unofficial population of 27 million people, if you, if you count all the immigrants, it's something like 24, 25 officially. Oh, man, massive, massive numbers. And we all know what those numbers mean up in our minds on a cognitive level, but uh, you don't really know what that means until you are in a crowd of a million people pressing slightly to the left, squishing you up against the, a wall and people start dying because of panic. I mean, those numbers represent something almost unfathomable. So in a city like this, when there is a rumor, when there is an idea of a viral outbreak of something that can kill you and something that is highly contagious, oh, it gets interesting. Am I infected? Uh, no. No, I am not. I actually went and got checked out because I had a uh, had a bit of a cold before I heard about this coronavirus, and and it was going on for a while. And um, I heard about the virus, and I'm like, "Holy crap! I have the symptoms of a cold, which is the symptoms of this virus." So uh, I was a little worried. Well, let's go check this out. So I got it checked out with the doctor, and he's like, "Don't worry, they tested me. I'm fine." So. Uh, that, that's that's the problem with a lot of um, a lot of diseases is that they all tend to manifest themselves in cold and flu symptoms. So yeah, suggestions on recovery after a heavy exercise session. How do you get over the soreness? Keep moving. Like uh, Mr. Who right there says, go again. Yeah, um, keep moving. So one one of the big problems that people have after a heavy exercise session is that they. And rest and recovery is important, but active recovery is super important. So keep moving, keep the blood coursing through your body, right? Anyway, Chinese New Year here in Shanghai. This massive, sprawling metropolis turns into a ghost town. And this happens every year. And so if you came to Shanghai right now and looked around, because it's still the Chinese New Year festival, it goes on for a couple weeks. Some, sometimes it goes on till mid-February. And... Uh, if this was your first time here, you would think, oh man, everybody's died because of the virus. This place is a ghost town. But no, that's, that's not the situation at all. But um, th there have been some, some advancements. I shouldn't say advancements. Some developments in what's happening here. Uh, do I enjoy trash talk in the UFC? Generally, no. But <laughs> there are a few exceptions to everything. A few exceptions to everything. Um, yeah, man, is China's social credit system really as bad as it seems? I honestly don't know much about it, man, because everybody outside of China is talking about the Chinese social credit score and nobody in China is really talking about that. So, so I, I don't really know much about it. Haven't uh, really been informed. I don't want to give you an uninformed opinion about something which is which should be objective fact you need to do audiobooks says Lori. i i have done a lot of audiobooks actually a ton of them so but i appreciate the vote of confidence if there are is anybody out there who would like me to record your audiobook please let me know i would be uh happy to look into that hmm. okay so Right now, in Shanghai, they <laughs> have passed a few laws. So all the gyms in Shanghai are closed right now. All of them. All of the churches, closed. All of the schools, closed. So they are not taking any risks with this, uh, this virus spreading. They don't want people to gather together in close proximity in large groups, basically. So... This is a, probably the best possible time this uh, outbreak could have happened, I, uh, ironically, I know, during Chinese New Year, because most of the businesses are closed anyway. 
But yeah, mandatorily, all of these businesses are closed by the government for, I think it is until uh, February 10th. We have churches in China. Yeah, China has churches. Surprise. I know Ch China has way different laws regarding religion than, say, uh, the United States, where they have um, freedom of religious expression as well as freedom of religious belief. But, uh, yeah, China is more about freedom of religious belief, not so much freedom of religious expression. So you can believe whatever you want, but if you want to express your religious ideas or even gather together in a church, you need to express permission from the government. So, yeah. Does Disneyland have Winnie the Pooh in China? Yes, it does, but Disneyland is also closed down right now because of the virus. So there have been relatively few cases of the coronavirus in Shanghai right now, but again, um, the government is trying to nip this in the bud so it doesn't get out of hand here and spread to the extent it did in Wuhan. What is my favorite color? Red. Bright, flaming red. So, yeah. Um, so what I've been doing, what have I been doing during this, uh, where do I go on vacation, says Master Dan's Carolina Martial Arts. Shout out to Master Dan. Um, well, this Chinese New Year vacation, haven't been able to go anywhere, basically, specifically because of the virus. The, the city's on quarantine, basically, which is really interesting. It is really interesting how you basically shut down a city this big one of the world's largest cities, and quarantine it. So uh, the grocery store up the road, for example, they won't let you in without a mask. Um, the security guards around my apartment complex, they won't let you out without a mask. Um, the U.S. Embassy recently recalled all of the families of um, the people who work for them. So, yeah, there's been a bit of an exodus of government workers from the United States in Shanghai recently. So yeah. All right, if you have any specific questions about the coronavirus, let me know. Otherwise, I'll just get straight into these MMA, martial arts, life advice related questions you have. So, okay, who asked that one? That's a great question, I like that. I'm, I'm gonna make a video about that when the gym opens up again. It's gonna, it's gonna be a while because I'm basically stuck at home, working out at home right now. But um, the Mea Lua, that's, that's one of the big ones. It's a, a spinning wheel kick, if you're not familiar, with a level change. I love that one a lot. It's, it's a great one specifically because of the level change in mixed martial arts. Okay. Um, I like to set up ankle picks and low singles with a Mea Lua. And the reason that works so well is because you throw it up high, it's this big, giant, kinetic motion that gets the focus up here on the head. Sometimes you'll hit them, sometimes you won't, but you'll always get the focus up here. And then immediately, since your upper body's already down on the ground, you shoot for the leg. So I love that one. I love that combination. I use it a lot. Um, what else? Uh, the armada, the, uh, what do you call that? The, um, it's like an arc kick. And that's, that's one of the few cases where, where the jinga will actually come into place in, in sparring when, when, when I use it. You might think the jinga, that's a little capoeira dance where you move to side to side and back and forth. But when I'm fighting somebody with um, really linear movement, like say a, a karate guy, and I spar with a lot of karate guys, a lot of taekwondo guys, a lot of sanda guys, muay thai guys, all, all these different fighters. So when, when you have these guys who come from like a karate or even a Muay Thai background, I find a lot of times those, those arc kicks coming into the side of the head with the leg they're not expecting when you shift from one side to the other work really well in combination. What else? Um, man, I'm blanking on my Portuguese because it's, it was like 20 years ago when I was in a capoeira club in college and I haven't used a lot of those names for a long time, but basically the, the back kick, the three-legged back kick, where you sit out, roll over, and plant on your hands and one foot and then do a back kick. I, I use that one a lot. Some interesting setups to that. So yeah, I'm going to do a uh, whole video about uh, the six capoeira techniques that, that I use for mixed martial arts. 
It's one of those martial arts where a lot of it is, is decorative or acrobatic and so on. But, uh, yeah. There are a few things, a few things that work really well. But the thing is, I uh, had a great comment from a guy on one of my videos about, um, about Krav Maga. And I've been pretty outspoken about uh, my experiences with Krav Maga instructors who were just absolutely terrible with, with their jobs and didn't know anything about fighting. And this guy said, you know, um, Capoeira works really well when you already know how to fight. Uh, not Capoeira, he, Krav Maga. And I thought, well, yeah, if you, if you already know how to fight, if you're an expert in fighting, you can weaponize any of these, any of these single emphasis martial arts better than anybody, really. You can take stuff from karate and capoeira and Wing Chun and all, all these other styles that often get the, uh, the reputation of being useless in MMA or whatever, and you can glean parts from them. All right. We got a super chat from the Ursidae Pugilist who says, For fun, what style will get a better representation in MMA in the future? Sport karate has moved up. Same with Taekwondo. Uh, probably Sanda. Chinese kickboxing. Specifically because the UFC is making a massive effort to recruit Chinese fighters into the UFC. They have built the largest UFC training facility in the world here in Shanghai which is closed right now because of the virus. So getting back to that. But yeah, they've invested a ton of money and a ton of effort, a ton of PR into expanding mixed martial arts in China, recruiting Chinese fighters. And most of the Chinese fighters come from a Sanda background. So yeah, when MMA starts taking off here, and it's, it's come a incredibly long way in the last 10 years, 10 years ago, Nobody knew what you were talking about if you said MMA or UFC or anything like that, or jiu-jitsu. There were a couple of guys in the whole country who understood it. Oh, sweet super chat from Fishy Talk. Thank you. Um, but yeah, now, again, there's a UFC training center here in, in Shanghai. Not a UFC gym, but a performance center to develop actual fighters. So I'm thinking probably within the next five years, we're going to see some probably really good fighters coming out of China. China, Kung Fu, what are they doing? Sunda, of course. And then everybody's going to go on this crazy Sunda kick for a while. And that's not a bad thing because, you know, it's a great combat sport and it teaches you a lot of really important things. Striking, um, takedowns in the context of striking, that's a huge thing for MMA. So yeah. All right. Did I watch the Conor McGregor against uh, Cerrone, Cerrone fight? Yeah, I did. I made a whole video about that. Go check it out. Could MMA become an Olympic sport? I hope not. I made a whole video about that. Go check that one out. What else? Got a lot of questions from Muhammad about the butterfly guard. Why butterfly guards are... Hold on, got to back this up. Because he's asked me this question a bunch of times. I touched on it a little bit. This is one of those show-not-tell type of things. But why butterfly guards in MMA are from the back, despite being a sitting guard? Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. So in sport jiu-jitsu, you, you can sit up, like, like sit up on your butt like this, okay? Have your hands up there. Marcelo Garcia is an absolute master of this. And you can tangle up the guy's legs and, and arm drag him from right there when he's standing and do, do all kinds of cool things because nobody's punching you in the head. In MMA, if you sit up in that position, you're going to get knocked out. You're going to feel what a, um, what do you call that? A bolo punch to the face feels like. That's a fairly uncommon technique in boxing these days, but if you're sitting up in the guard there, and you're going to find out what a knockout feels like really quick. So if you're playing butterfly guard in MMA, it has to be essentially on your back or clinched up. If you're sitting up, you have to be tied up with that other guy and have your head right next to his head so you're not getting hit, okay? And butterfly guard in MMA is a much more dynamic position than it is in jiu-jitsu because it has to be. A lot of those open guards are. All of the open guards are, really. So you might think, oh, I've never seen spider guard in MMA. I've never seen X guard, except you have. It just doesn't work the same way. It happens much, much more quickly and much more dynamically than it does in jiu-jitsu. 
So you might not even recognize what, that it's happening. That's the reason we don't see that sitting up butterfly guard in MMA. Yeah, was it Hodger Gracie who said 80% of jujitsu jitsu and a lot of people got mad about that? But yeah. Okay, what else do we have here? Yeah, when you introduce strikes into your grappling, your grappling has to change. It has to adapt. It has to evolve. So a lot of the stuff that worked really well in sport jiu-jitsu, you have to throw in the garbage. So uh, grappling... And grappling for MMA are radically different skill sets. I, I see this at a time when somebody is a really good grappler in the context of sport jiu-jitsu, but they've never put on the gloves, they've never eaten punches, they've never done that in, in the context of striking, and then they go back to being white belts for a while, and then they kind of have to relearn a lot of things, which, which is unfortunate. So I would recommend um, if MMA is your goal train MMA concurrently with jiu-jitsu. Again, MMA is not just jiu-jitsu plus a boxing class on the side, plus some Muay Thai class, plus whatever other type of class. It's its, its own unique sport, and you have to train it as such. Oh. What traditional martial arts should I learn to add a little flavor to my MMA? And if you know how to fight, any of them. If you don't know how to fight, stick to the basics. All right, what else do we have going on here? My feed stopped for a moment. Ah, here we go. How do I get started in MMA without a gym? I don't have a gym in my city. Okay, I've, I've had hundreds of people ask me similar questions to this. How do I train by myself? And usually I say it's going to be much more effective if you go join a gym, but if you simply don't have one. For example, when I first moved here to Shanghai, there were no MMA gyms. And so what did I do? I started my own. Now, I had my own MMA gym when I lived back in the U.S. I had experience coaching. I'd been doing it for a while. And so I wasn't starting from absolute zero, if you will. But, uh, yeah. I didn't have what I needed, so what did I do? I invented it, if you will. Why did I move to Shanghai? You know, there's no big story there. Everybody wants a big story about why I came to Shanghai, why I moved to China. Um, had some conversations with my wife before we moved here. We, she felt like she needed a, wanted a change in her life. And I was like, oh, okay, sure, why not? Let's, uh, let's do something different. And, you know, I'd always wanted to go to Asia, see what, was, what it was all about. We had a friend from Shanghai who said, hey, I can... I can hook you up with some jobs over there. And so we said, okay, let's go give it a try. We came over here to China. And yeah, I worked for a while at Shanghai Normal University and taught some classes over there. And yeah, I decided I like it here. I'm going to stay. So that's, that's the story. It's not a big, looks like I lost the signal there for a minute. Looks like we're back, okay, maybe. I'm still here if you are. Uh, we got a super chat from Unchained Verse. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate that. I heard you paint houses. Paint the house, paint the fence, wax the car, sand the floor. <laughs> All right, what else? Opinion on wrestling for transitioning to MMA. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've probably heard that wrestling is a fantastic base for MMA, and I won't disagree with that. It absolutely is. And it's a great base for MMA for a lot of reasons. And a lot of those have nothing to do with technique. Some of them do. But um, a big part of it is simply the mental toughness, the fact that you train on a consistent basis. Okay, think about this. The average high school wrestler, when he finishes high school, if he's wrestled for four years in high school, how many wrestling of them? A bunch of them. I mean, even casually wrestling, not even with aspirations of, of being a state champion or whatever. 
you know, that guy could have 50 wrestling matches, essentially full contact fights, if you will, or the wrestling equivalent of that, okay? In front of a crowd experiencing performance anxiety, and that's a big deal. One of the most difficult skill sets to develop for mixed martial arts is not the technical aspect, not the physical aspect, not the, um, you know, throwing the punches and the kicks and in, in the right way or, or doing the right jiu-jitsu techniques. It's, it's being able to perform in front of a group of people against a live, athletic, highly athletic human being who is trying to who is trying to do horrible things to you against your will. And wrestling gives you that again and again and again and again. So, you know, these guys who wrestle throughout high school, then they do it again throughout college, it's no big deal performing in front of people in a cage, right? They have to learn a lot of things. So what, what do you have to do to essentially adapt your wrestling to, to MMA? Okay, well, start training for one. Like I always say, get out there and train. I know that sounds dismissive, but it's the truth. Find yourself a good gym, a good gym that will introduce you to sparring, safe sparring, that they're not going to beat you up on day one. They're not going to give you concussions or anything like that, but they will teach you how to spar, okay? Um... Julian says, where can I find my uh, Kunlun Fights with my commentary? Um, Kunlun Fight does have a website. You can check that out. Google them. Um, one of the subscribers told me that he was watching Kunlun Fight on a sport network. Ah, man, I don't remember which one it was. Like the Fight Network, I think it was. And he heard my, my voice in the commentary, so I was happy to see that. I think he was watching Kunlun Fight number 86. That was a few months back. So they're backed up a bit as far as broadcasting. But yeah, go check out Kunlun Fights. Oh, did we just cut out again? Okay, we're back. Ah, <laughs> Unchained Verse says, has the Chinese government or anyone for that matter ever tried to... Gov government does not meddle in my personal affairs. The Chinese government has no control over YouTube. YouTube is an American company. So the Chinese government is not pulling the strings there. So as what I say or do on YouTube, um, yeah, man. So no, the Chinese government does not meddle in my affairs. Fine. So yeah, I, my business is talking about MMA. My business is coaching fighters to win fights. My business has nothing to do with meddling with government affairs. So we're copacetic on that front. All right. Question from Chris Morgan. Is it worth it taking Taekwondo to learn some good kicks for MMA? Or is it a waste of my time kicking wooden boards and stuff like that? Okay. Uh, Taekwondo has some fantastic techniques. There are seven basic kicks of Taekwondo. And you don't have to spend ten years in the gym learning all these kicks. What is most applicable for mixed martial arts... Oh man, what do we have here? Hold on just one moment, guys. I'll be right back. We got someone at the door. Wait. 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 You guys are back early. Okay, I'm back. Looks like my, my kids and my wife are coming home, so they may jump on me in just a minute. And we may have to cut this live stream short. But yeah, Taekwondo kicks. Uh, the, the turning back kick, absolutely fantastic. Side kicks have a ton of great applications. I would love to make some videos about that when my gym opens up again. All right. Uh, Fishy Talk says he films himself sparring a lot and he really lacks head movement and so on. All right, you're doing the right thing filming yourself. One of the most underrated things you should be doing in the gym constantly is filming yourself. Film your sparring sessions and study them. The most important fighter to do a film study on is yourself. What's up? Oh, is he, no one's here? No, I'm here. They're out. I'm just doing a live stream on YouTube right now. Oh, shit. That's okay. Oh. No, they're, they're out downstairs, like, walking around the... Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Anything I can do? Can I just leave my... Oh, 
Oh, we got some lag? I hope not. Uh, film your kata? Sure, do that too. So film your sparring, film your roles, film, film what, what goes in the gym is for yours. I even heard Eddie Bravo recently say, the most important thing you can be doing to improve your jiu-jitsu is film it and study it. And I was like, bravo, Eddie Bravo. Bravo, yes, he gets it. The man gets it. So, what else? and karate in MMA in the near future. Maybe. I mean, man, there are over 400 different styles of Kung Fu out there. Did you guys know that? I hear most people on the internet are talking about Kung Fu like it's one style, like it's one thing, but there are over 400 different styles of Kung Fu, and some of them are radically different from each other. Like, radically different. Got some sort of phone call going on over there. Um, yeah. Do fighters get permanent damage from breaking boards? No, man, no. Boards are easy to break. Hold on one minute. I'll be right back. Seriously, right back. Hold that thought about breaking boards. After I broke that board on my head, um, yeah, we had, uh, had a bit of an issue there. So does, does it permanently injure you? I mean, that's, that's a board. What is it? It's like, it's like, uh, I don't know. It, it's pine, but yeah, these things are easy to break. If, if you are a competent martial artist, they're going to break and you'll, you'll go right through it. I mean, <laughs> right there. And that, that's free holding that that's a pine board. Okay. So, is my hand permanently damaged? No, man, no. It's, it's easy. It's, it's super easy. Barely an inconvenience, man. Quoting one of my favorite YouTube channels right there. <sighs> if they don't break and you punch incorrectly, you might damage yourself somehow. All right, here's, here's how you break boards if you don't know how. Punch through it. If you stop right there, you know, it'll be about as damaging as knocking on a door with your knuckles. <laughs> but you want to punch through it. You want your fist to go through it. If somebody's holding it for you, oh man, it go, it's like cutting through paper. It's easy. Holding it yourself requires more speed and all that. That's, that's a more difficult trick, but um, easy. Easy, man. Anybody can break boards. My, my daughter could break boards at age five, man. So... Oh, what's my weekly schedule for workouts? Right now, since all the gyms in Shanghai are closed, not, not much, but uh, A-Dog Yo says, Ramsey, I want to spar you. A-Dog Yo, I want to spar you, man. I want to spar you. Boards are tight. <laughs> Quote one of my favorite YouTube channels as well. You know who I'm talking about, man. Um, but yeah, if, if any of y'all want to spar, come on over here to Shanghai after this viral epidemic clears up, hopefully, and I'll be happy to spar with you. First day of BJJ today. Any tips? Says Samurai Yun. I'm assuming that's a Chinese last name. Samurai Yun. Any tips on your first day of BJJ? Have fun, man. Have fun and relax. Three things I always tell new students when they do jujitsu. Number one, relax. Number two, keep breathing. And number three, try to be the guy on top. And if you can't be the guy on top, just relax and keep breathing. Yeah. Pay attention, have fun, you'll, you'll learn a bunch. Listen to your coach, okay? And be patient, be really patient. A lot of people get very impatient with jujitsu because it takes a long time to learn. It doesn't happen all at once. Hmm. So my weekly workout schedule when the gyms are open, what's that like? It's, it's different, man, it's different. Um, generally, man, I train a bunch of times every day because because I teach a bunch of classes every day. So um, on top of all the classes I teach, I also do strength and conditioning for myself, which generally consists of weightlifting. So it's a periodized weightlifting program. Uh, I like to have that set up so I can lift daily because I love lifting, man. So I do squats generally three times a week. Yeah, I know that's a lot. I'm, a, I'm one of those crazy nuts who loves leg day, man. Absolutely love it. 
And am I going to break a board? I already did, but I, th I think I have another one right here. Ha! Yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, does that leave permanent damage? No, like I said, boards are easy to break. So, for those of you who missed that, uh, that board breaking I did. Yeah, boards are easy, easy to break, man. Do, do I prefer pride rules or UFC rules? Um, man, good question. I thought the rounds in pride were interesting because they had that really long first round. And I, I would love to see rounds go away in MMA. I think that would be really interesting at this point in the game now that we have fighters who actually understand what MMA is supposed to be, okay? And if, if you could go back to something similar to original UFC rules, you know, no time limits, that sort of thing, um, that would be really interesting to me. It might turn out to, to be something really boring, but uh, yeah. Thoughts on safely training headbutts for Lethway or whatever. Um, you know, you, you might have seen me break this board with my head. Um, if you're headbutting, use, use the, the front of your forehead, the frontal bone. That's the hardest part right there. Okay. Don't use the soft, squishy bits. Use the hard stuff right here. And you want to align your head and neck and spine. You want to have essentially perfect posture. Not like stand up like a tin soldier perfect posture. Perfect fighting posture, right? Where the head, neck, and spine and tailbone are in a straight line, okay? Um, not a big fan of headbutts personally, but... <laughs> Super Chat Board Replacement Funds, thank you, Wyatt Bray. You are a champion, my friend. Anyway, uh, not a big fan of headbutts, but if, if you're going to train them, yeah, use the front of your forehead, yeah, you know, hit something softer than your head, because that's what you would do in a fight, hit the soft, squishy parts of the face, or even the sternum right there, as opposed to, uh, yeah, hitting bone against bone. When was my first fight? Uh, my first professional fight, I think, when was it? I think that was back in 2004. It was a professional kickboxing match. Uh, my first pro MMA fight, man, I, I don't remember. It was a few years later. Thoughts on jumping into martial arts without health insurance? Hmm. Hmm. And that's, a, that's a good question. If you live in the United States, that's a big concern. Health insurance, man, because health care in the U.S. is so, so expensive. Sebastian360 says Spanish. Español. <laughs> El precio de cuidarse en los Estados Unidos es tan, tan caro. It's so expensive in the U.S. to, uh, to um, yeah, pay for that stuff. So if, if you don't have health insurance, yeah, be, be really, really careful. What else do we have? I've lost my stream of questions. What's going on? Chat is disconnected. Please wait while we reconnect you. Unable to reconnect. Hold on, let me let me try refreshing this page, see what happens so I can hear your questions again. Thoughts on battle ropes? I like battling ropes. They're fun. I, f I find it fun. Some people hate them, it's tedious. But I, I enjoy them, and I think it's great exercise. There are a lot of variations you can do with them. You know, it's uh, it's... It can be very explosive movement, which is very similar to, to the, the way you can use your, you use your muscles in a fight. You can improve your grips, you can improve your, uh, your cardio, and so on. Any thoughts on Icy Mike's latest video about blocking? Oh, you mean like uh, catching kicks, turning like that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good video. Um, yeah, I made a video about that same subject eight years ago. A bunch of people had been asking me about how to catch midsection kicks lately. I guess they were also asking Icy Mike as well, um, because we, we have a lot of the same viewer uh, viewer base. So yeah, that, that's a good video. Like Icy Mike's advice about, you know, turn the body, catch the midsection kick, not a leg kick, not a head kick, but a midsection kick with your forearm. One thing I would add to what he said, as opposed to just keeping the arm up there, is rotate like this, the way Chinese Sanda fighters do. You'll see that in my video. It's, it's a rotation from the hip that can take a lot of the sting, a lot of the power off of that kick. But yeah, for the most part, uh, pretty decent video. Go check that one out. I did watch that one. Um, 
How much Mandarin do I speak? Not enough, man. Not enough. I speak some, but if you want to have a conversation about uh, a significant topic, then uh, about any, any type of meaningful topic, then yeah, I will be out of my league there. Thoughts on ITF versus WTF Taekwondo. Um, I practiced WTF Taekwondo for a very long time. That's the World Taekwondo Federation. Okay. Let's see if we can reconnect there. <laughs> he finally gets an answer to his question and it freezes. Are we back? Talking about, uh, talking about taek Taekwondo. Uh, what's the state of Kunlun fight? It's awesome. Great fight show. Go check it out. But back to the question about Taekwondo. Um, ITF rules. They allow punches to the face, I would say, and it's light contact from what I understand, not like full contact punching, but light contact. I would recommend anyone who is serious about ITF, terrible, terrible boxers. Um, so if your martial art allows punches to the face, cross train in boxing. What else? How to see punches coming? Is there a way to know what punch your opponent is going to throw? Yes, there are several ways the most effective to throw. How do you do that? How do you program a person the same way you program a computer? Well, not really. Not really. A different way. So if, if you're just minding your own business and somebody walks up to you and pushes you like, hey, what are you doing? What is your reaction? Maybe it's push him back. If somebody hits you, what's your reaction? Hit him back in the same way. Maybe hit him harder. Make him learn a lesson from that, that, from that experience. Somebody kicks you, what do you do? You kick him back the same way. We want an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That is our natural instinct. So, how do you program somebody to punch a very specific place or kick a very specific place at a very specific time? You do it to them first. And you do it in a way that makes them think, I can do better. Sunda fighters are really good at this. They throw these kind of wimpy looking, really fast, flippy kicks at the legs. Who's in connection here? Ah. Their opponents feel these flippy kicks to the legs and they're like, oh, I can, I can one up you there. And they th try to throw a kick with the same leg in the same spot, but hard and heavy and telegraphed because they're mad. And then the Sunda fighter catches that kick, boom, and then counters. Now that's a brilliant strategy. So that is the number one way I would recommend to predict your opponent is program him to move the way you want him to move. All right, if you're not at that level yet, watch the body, watch the torso, the area between the shoulders and the hips. Don't watch the hands, don't watch the feet, don't look at the eyes like Mr. Miyagi says. Watch the torso, because you see the torso move boom, before the hand gets to you. All right, what else do we have? Do you need to take a penetration step for a double leg in MMA? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Uh, the penetration step is super important. What that is, is driving into your opponent. You need to essentially unbalance your opponent. Like Jack Dempsey said, it's not a setup unless it unbalances your opponent. That's true in boxing and it's true in wrestling and it's true in wrestling for MMA especially. So... You can set up a double leg in a lot of interesting ways in MMA that you can't really do in wrestling. For example, with a big overhand right, get the focus up here, and then shoot down low when the guy brings his guard up. But you need that penetration step. What else? Are we lagging over there on your end, man? Sorry about that. It's the Great Firewall of China, guys. The Great Firewall of China. So somebody asked if the uh, Chinese government meddles in my affairs. The, the only real way that you could say that is through the Great Firewall of China causing lag on these live streams. Um, but yeah, if you're setting up a double leg from, say, an over-under clinch, you got an overhook, you got an underhook, did you know you can set up a double leg from there? And you, you rip down on that, uh, that overhook and elevate on that underhook, and then you drop, but you, you have to shoot down under the guy's hips. You got to knock his hips forward, get his, get his body over your shoulder, essentially, so you can lift and then turn, right? That movement has to unbalance your opponent. 
You absolutely have to, because without that penetration step, if he's not unbalanced and you shoot for the legs, your opponent. Okay. A few different ways. One, like I said, program him to move the way you want him to move. Okay. And when you do a film study, instead of looking for mistakes, look for patterns. Get as many videos of your opponent as you can over long periods of time. And look for commonalities. Look for habits, long-term habits, stuff he had years ago that he's still doing today. Movement ticks that he was doing last year that he's still doing today. Okay, that's a huge thing. I still got that lag going on, man. What else? The next thing, watch the body, like I was saying, watch the area between the, the shoulders and the hips, look at the torso, because when we see this type of movement, generally we can predict one of those coming after it. The best counterpunch, ooh, the cross, the check hook, those are, I would say those are about equal in usefulness, because they, they come up all the time, constantly. Uh, do you know the difference between a cross and a straight punch? I know those terms are often used interchangeably, even by a lot of great boxers and great uh, coaches out there. I use them differently, the same way that Jack Dempsey used them. A cross is a counterpunch. It's a straight punch that goes over your opponent's straight punch, forming a cross in the arms. The arms cross each other. That's why we call it a cross. You slip a punch and throw a straight right, so it's a cross. If you're just uh, leading with a straight right or boom, boom, throwing your one-two, not a cross. I know a lot of people colloquial call it, colloquially call it that, but no, when I say cross, I'm talking about a counterpunch specifically. But yeah, the cross and the check hook, best counterpunches in my opinion. Okay, what else do we have? What do I think of 1FC's system of walking weight? Is it better than the usual weigh-in system? Uh, kind of. Yeah, my dream for the sport of mixed martial arts is do away with weight cutting 100%. Just get rid of it. Have same day weigh-ins. Have the fighters weigh in right before they go into, into the cage, like an hour before. When I started fighting um, professionally, that's how it was done. We didn't have uh, 24 hours to rehydrate or anything like that. It was same day weigh-ins. And it was awesome. It was great. <laughs> this question again about the, would I rather fight 100 duck-sized Master Wongs or one? Oh, never mind. That's just a funny question. Yeah, man. Moving on with these questions. Khabib or Tony for my prediction. My gut tells me Khabib, but my mind is telling me, well, Tony's, Tony's got some tools that Khabib is not used to. So maybe, maybe he's got the edge in that fight, but my gut is telling me Khabib. So that's, that's my prediction. Khabib by, by wrestle punching, man. Ooh. Would I consider being in the McDojo Life documentary, says Max King. Yeah, man, if Rob wants me to be in his documentary, I'll, I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah, did an in cool guy, great channel, uh, heavily underrated YouTube channel. I know Rob is huge on Instagram and Facebook, but go check him out here on YouTube as well. A lot of people don't even know that McDojo Life has a, uh, a YouTube channel. And if you're not familiar um, with what he's doing right now, uh, Rob at McDojo Life is starting a documentary about McDojo's, and it's awesome. So go check him out on his channel. He's doing some fundraising, some crowdfunding for that. So if you want to help out, you can. So shout out to McDojo Life, man. Who has the nicest feet in the UFC? Is that a reference to that video I made about footwork the other day where I said, 
when I watch a fight, I want to see the fighter's feet in the shot because I want to know what they're doing. I want to see their footwork. And everyone's like, oh, ha, 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 Ramsey has a foot fetish. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. You guys are hilarious, man. You guys are hilarious. I really like Kung Fu Wing Chun, actually, but I want to do a sport fight. What should I do? Train for a sport fight. You can do Wing Chun. You can do all of these things. I do a lot of martial arts as a hobby. And sometimes I can extrapolate something from those martial arts that works really well in mixed martial arts. And sometimes that doesn't happen. Like we had a question earlier about capoeira. There are six capoeira techniques that I use in mixed martial arts. I've had to adapt them, of course. But I use them and I teach them and I think they're awesome. Everything else in capoeira, I, I don't use. Not to say that you can't, but I'm very difficult to interpret, if you will. It's a grappling style, if you didn't know. So, works really well in the stand-up phase of a fight, if you understand. Old chi fighter, have I? No, I've never met anybody who was able to substantiate the claims that they made. I've heard a lot of people claim they have magic powers, people claim they can dodge bullets, they can throw invisible fireballs at you, they can knock out touching you, they can make themselves impervious to damage, turn invisible, whatever. Yeah, real things that real people have said, but nobody has been able to substantiate any of these in front of me. So, yeah, that's not something I'll put a lot of stock into. The stream keeps freezing from time to time. I know, I know. It's the Great Firewall of China trying to prevent this discourse between us, which is why I don't do these very often. Sometimes I have a really good internet connection, sometimes not so much. But, yeah... All right. What other questions do you have? Probably have a couple more minutes here till I have to go. So what do we have? Is it important for Southpaws to train with other Southpaws? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, because there are way more Southpaws in fighting than there are in life. So there are a lot of Southpaws in fighting. So if you're a Southpaw, you're going to fight another Southpaw eventually. Do you, do you remember when Conor McGregor fought, um, was it Nate or Nick Diaz? I, man, I always confuse those two. Sorry, Nate and Nick Diaz. You, your names are so, so similar. But um, when Conor McGregor fought the left-handed Diaz, biting him from that Southpaw stance, and, and the Diaz brothers can switch stances easily, but point in the fight he was fighting from a southpaw stance and he did this slap the Stockton slap with a check hook to get out of the way of Connor's legendary epic moment in the fight um Connor has had way of um all southpaws really simply because there are way more right-handed people than, than left-handed people so if you are a southpaw statistically speaking a significant percentage of your fights will be against other southpaws so yes train with people from both stances. That's important, man. What happens when you get kicked in the nards during an MMA spar? Well, if you got a tie steel cup on and you tie it the way I told you to in my last video, go check that out. You'll be fine. If that happens in an MMA fight, then yeah, you get up to five minutes to recover and take your time. Take advantage of that five minutes, even if you don't need it. All right, a couple of super chats. One from Aman, who says, what is your favorite submission hold? I, I have a fond place in my heart for the loco plata. I don't use it a whole lot, but I, I enjoy doing it when it happens. The one I really, I'm, I, I'm really good at, I would say, the, be, the best at, is probably the triangle choke. I'm trying to expand my horizons and move into other things more than simple triangle setups, but I do enjoy the triangle choke as well, and I'm, and I'm pretty good at that one. Have another super chat from, let's back up here, from Adrian uh, Benningfield, who says, Ramsey, can you check out Mark Macy? He is a good teacher. I'm not familiar with Mark Macy. Um, I'll check that out afterward. What, what does he teach? Like martial arts, self-defense, MMA? I'll, I'll look it up. Mark Macy, thank you for the recommendation. Are there effective ways to teach yourself MMA or any form of martial arts? Okay, going back to self-training. 
Self-training is better than nothing. But when you are training by yourself, you're missing out on a lot, man. When I started training for fights, I was largely training by myself, you know, with books and videos and things like that. That only gets you so far. And, man, when I started training with an experienced, professional, qualified coach for the first time, all these light bulbs went off in my head and I was like, whoa, I can get so much better, so much faster. This is amazing. This is incredible. Fighting, it looks like a solo sport on the outside. It's not. You need that coach. You need that team behind you, man. So make every effort to train with a team. And you might be thinking, well, I don't have the money. I don't have this. I don't have that, whatever. You have to make sacrifices. It's not about making time for it. It's about getting rid of something else to make room for it. So sacrifice means to make holy. How do you make something holy? You, you get rid of something good for something better. Want You have to ask yourself that. What are you willing to sacrifice to get what you want? Ask yourself that question. Be really, really real with yourself about what you can and cannot afford. Both as far as time, talent, and money go. Your coach says your feet are too big to spar. That is nuts. I don't know why he would say that. That's crazy advice. Um, get a second opinion, my friend. Get a second opinion. Here's a second opinion. Your feet are not the problem. All right. Adrian Blooming Benningfield says, I recommend him. He is a great teacher. Oh, about um, Mark, the fellow you mentioned before. All right. Thank you. And thanks for the super chat, Adrian. I'll check him out again. Hatchet, super chat from him. Keep up the great content. Thank you. What's the best way to bounce in MMA? I don't, I don't know what you mean by bounce. Uh, our friend Mohammed is asking that. What's the best way to bounce in MMA? He has asked that question a few times, but I, I don't know what you mean. Do you mean like like uh, moving up and down like you see fighters do sometimes? I, I'm not sure. Uh, clarify that for me, if you will. Oh, that's an inter interesting question. Hold on here. Hold on. This might be the last question I have time for, but let's see. A total effing loser says, is it hard to be an MMA coach in China right now with all the traditional martial arts worshiping? I, I think you got a misinformed idea of, of what's going on in China right now. What traditional martial arts worshipping? People who practice martial arts in China are the minority. The minority. Let me give you some context. Not even traditional martial arts, but lo let's look at Sanda, professional Sanda fighters. There are about 10,000 people in this whole country who train in Sanda. 10,000 out of a population of 1.3 billion people. It's a tiny little drop in the bucket. If you see 10,000 people all together, that looks like a big group. But spread out throughout a whole country, that's nothing. Okay, so if you put all the people who trained in Wing Chun or Tai Chi or whatever, actually, everybody's Tai Chi exercises in the morning here. But people who get like really, really deep into Tai Chi, Tai Chi Twin, it's a small group. And small groups often tend to develop cult mentalities, and so um, they become squeaky wheels on the internet who shout loudly like, ah, whatever, right? So they tend to seem bigger than they really are. Do I do Tai Chi? Yeah, I, I love Tai Chi Twin. Love it. I love it. I, I've told the story about meeting Master U Dao Shui like 10 years ago. The dude was fantastic, 80-year-old man. He'd been practicing Tai Chi Twin his whole life. The student knew how to fight, taught me a lot of great things, a lot of techniques I use to this day fantastic and it's not what you think it is it's a whole lot more like wrestling and a whole lot less like mystical mumbo jumbo all right everybody always asks me about shu shaodong on these live chats if you look at any of my live chats we've got questions and answers about shu shaodong i'm just gonna have to make a video about him so i can refer you to that one of these days what do i think about him he's an interesting Persona, interesting character, man. 
He's a guy with a, uh, a noble quest of exposing the truth. Is he going about it in the best possible way? Probably not. But yeah, I'll, I'll put that on my to-do list to make a video about Xu Shaodong so that everybody asking my opinion about that can be referred straight to that video. Do you recommend having longer, sharp toenails for sparring? No, trim your nails, man. If you're the kid with claws on you for sparring, cut that out, trim those, chop those off, man, because you're gonna cut and scratch your training partners and you're gonna spread infections. You are going to spread deadly mat-borne illnesses, including but not limited to flesh-eating bacteria. So trim your nails. Sparring is not about inflicting damage on your training partners. Yeah, Staphylococcus. That's what I'm talking about. Lewis knows what's up. Lewis knows what's up, man. So yeah, so don't practice your eagle claw, tiger claw techniques, flesh raking and all that on your training partners. Sparring is about improving at martial arts, and if your training partners are dead from a staph infection, or they can't come to train, or they don't want to spar with you because you're a jerk who keeps scratching them, then... Yeah, you're not going to learn. So trim your nails. Trim your nails. Would I do a live stream with the Ginger Ninja Trickster? Man, if he wants to, sure. I have a very difficult time doing live streams with other people from China, though. I've done a few of them. Uh, I did one with Quan Kicker. That was my first one. That was a cool cool one. Go check that out on the Quan Kicker channel. Did one with, uh, with Rokas from Martial Arts Journey. Did one with uh, Sergio over at Practical Combat Martial Arts. I've been trying to time one with, uh, with Joe and Brad from Fight Perfect TV. And uh, if you're wondering, they're coming back, man. They're coming back. You can't keep good fighters down, man. Like Jack Dempsey said, a champion is a man who gets up when he can't. And they're getting up, man. So we just haven't been able to get our Thursday schedules <laughs> together, man. But one day we will. We'll do it. It's going to be fantastic. I've been wanting to do a live chat with, uh, with our friend Red Shucks, but um, his channel got deleted from YouTube. If you didn't know that, his channel got deleted. I don't know why. Uh, he sent me an email about it afterward. So, man, Rip Sh Red Shucks, I miss your channel, man. I hope you come back. Hope you come back. And I'm still totally down to do the, the live stream, live chat with you because you're an awesome dude. I would love to, love to have that conversation. What else? Um, all right, Saltimus, super chat from Saltimus. It says, hey man, you should actually think about streaming. <laughs> okay. By the way, I just started training Southpaw full time. That's why I changed stances a lot at the UFL gym. Is it okay to change stances during fights. Saltimus, are you one of my students at the UFL gym? <laughs> okay, um, well, thank you for the super chat. Let's see here. I'm trying to figure out who you are, because I've had a few students who changed stances. I know Jordan Chow changed uh, stances, but he, he did it way back when we were at the J JX Fight Club. And for those of you wondering what happened to the JX Fight Club, it closed. We changed gyms. We're at the UFL gym now in Shanghai, China. So, oh, Mateo, Mateo, you're Sultimus. All right, Mateo, go check out Mateo. He, he did a video with us um, where we tried out one of Master Wong's techniques, our last MMA fighters try out, um, try out uh, self-defense techniques video. Uh, Mateo, awesome guy. He, he came over here, visited us here in, in Shanghai, trained with us. Um, awesome dude. So let me take a look at that question. Mateo switched stances. All right, so he just started training Southpaw full, full time. Uh, is it okay to change stances during fights? If, if you have a solid understanding of, of stances, if you have a solid understanding of both stances, yeah, sure, then you can change stances whenever for whatever reason. But you have to know why, you have to have a reason behind it. If you're just changing stances and you don't know how to fight Southpaw, you're in for a rude awakening when you vice versa. So, yeah, nothing wrong with, uh, with switching stances. Like, our friend Jordan Chow, he's in a bunch of my videos. He has... He, he switched stances, switched to the southpaw stance. He's a right-handed guy, 
But he said, I want to learn how to fight Southpaw. So he started training exclusively in that stance, and he struggled with it for a while, but he, he got better. He got a lot better. So I think he's one of those guys who right now could switch stances pretty effectively. What else? Am I worried about the coronavirus? I mean, sure, man, it is a legitimate concern. There is this virus. It has killed over 300 people right now and counting, and it's expanding throughout the world. And I, I don't want to downplay the seriousness of it because it is a deadly killer virus that is killing people and has killed a number of individuals. At the time, I don't worry about these things because statistically speaking, we are much more likely, much, much more likely to die of so many other things. Did they find a cure yet? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. I'm sure when a cure, if and when it's found, then we'll, we'll know about it. They'll shout it from the rooftops, hopefully. But yeah, statistically speaking, you're way more likely to die from a heart attack, from heart disease, from a stroke, from tons of other upper respiratory infections, from, from a car accident. Car accidents are so much more likely to kill you than a killer deadly virus, man. But most people don't worry when they get into their cars. Most people don't think, hey, I might not, might not wake up tomorrow getting into my car today. But yeah, if, if you are fixated, if you are freezed, if you're frozen with fear because of the possibility of death, you're in the wrong place because none of us gets out of here alive, man. None of us leaves this world alive. So accept the fact you're going to die like the great swordsman wrote that the code of the warrior is the resolute acceptance of death. Everyone knows they're going to die on a cerebral level, but the warrior understands it right here. Make peace with that. Living without fear in that respect is much better than living paralyzed in fear. All right. I keep saying I'm going to go, but uh, yes. Was that the art of war? No, that was um, Miyamoto Musashi said that. In the Book of the Twelve Rings. Oh, okay. Boards don't hit back. Oh no, it's a board! Ah! 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 It hit me back. <laughs> What's the worst injury I had in my career? Uh, compound depressed skull fracture. My last fight, the one that forced me into retirement, my opponent loaded his gloves. I talked about this in a ton of videos, but yeah, that was the worst injury. It forced me into retirement, put a hole in my head, left me with a blind spot in my eye. Rematch with that guy. That guy's fighting in the UFC right now, man. I'm retired. He's fighting in the UFC. I got a hole in my head. He is in the prime of his life. So, yeah, man. Can I smell what The Rock is cooking? <laughs> you guys and your jokes. Did I speak with the guy afterward? Yeah, Wang Guan. Uh, we're friends now. We're friends. I've gotten past that instant. I have forgiven him. And we, we had a chat on Instagram the other day, actually. You know, sent me a message saying, hey, how's your family doing? Really nice guy, actually. Really nice guy. Did I consider suing him? No. No, absolutely not. I know that, that probably sounds crazy to some of you guys. You know, that whole eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I hit you, I, you know, you hit me back mentality. But uh, no, man, I, I don't like living with that burden on me. The burden of vengeance is a heavy one, guys. Let that one go. Super chat from Time Traveler 71. Oh, man, how is the future, my, my friend, or the past? I don't know. Any thoughts on Jeet Kune Do? Be well from the virus. Thank you. You too, because that is spreading across the world. Time Traveler 71. Jeet Kune Do. Man, I've had pretty inconsistent experiences with Jeet Kune Do. Man, you're going to have a different experience with Jeet Kune Do depending on where you go, because again, it's about seeking your own style, your own way, if you will. So yeah, man. If you have a chance to train at the CSW camp, with Eric Paulson, he was, he was a Jeet Kune Do guy. Yeah, go check that out. That's a, that is a legitimate camp, man. 
Who else? Can we see your feet? You guys on the feet, man. What is up with you guys on the feet? Grappler looking for striking. Okay. That question's right up my alley. Grappling look, grappler looking for striking. Should I consider boxing or Muay Thai? Yes, yes, you should. Can punching only make up for weak or no kicking? Uh, as far as MMA, you got to know your kicking game. In this day and age, you, you can't get away with not understanding kicks. So you got to know how to kick. You got to know how to time your kicks, your counter kicks. You got to understand your front kick, your teep, your round kicks. Sidekicks, back kicks, all of it. You have to be a complete fighter in this day and age. At the same time, if you are one of those, if you're a kickboxer, if you're a Muay Thai fighter, if you're a Taekwondo guy, if you're a karate guy, learn boxing. Anytime I have a student who is a really good kicker, almost without fail, they're a terrible boxer. And so for every round of kickboxing, they do every round of MMA sparring they do, I have them do a round of boxing as well, with the hands and their feet. We got some weird foot fetishists on the chat today. Guys, what is up with you? Keep it on topic, please. Thoughts on Shotokan Karate? I trained in Shotokan Karate way back in the day, like 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I trained with this guy named Paul, this older gentleman back in Utah. He, uh, he had a Shotokan club at my college. I joined all the martial arts clubs I could. And he was one of those one punch, one kill guys, like... I remember the first day of class, there was this giant football player, this tiny young lady, and me and, and this other dude in the class, and he goes down the line, he's like, I can defeat you because I have superior bone alignment, and I can defeat you because I have superior bone alignment, and he looks at the giant football player who's like 10 times our size and says, and I can even defeat you because of my bone alignment. And, you know, kind of a goofy conversation, but he, he did teach some really good some really good things. Uh, also taught weapons as well. Taught some Kabuto, uh, Kubaton stuff. Um, so I, I enjoyed that that class. So Shotokan Karate has a whole lot in common technically with Taekwondo, because Taekwondo, modern Taekwondo, borrowed a lot from the forms of Shotokan Karate. But if you look at the side by side, stylistically they're radically different. So. It, it was an interesting experiment training both at the same time, Taekwondo and Shotokan, because again, we had that emphasis. On oh man, it looks like we lost the stream again. Are we coming back? Your view on Asmralimilao, oh, I don't know what that means, man. Maybe don't speak in... Um, abbreviations, acronyms. I don't, I don't speak acronymies, guys. All right. Let's take a couple more questions here. Oh, is there a super chat I missed? Ah, can you attempt a front flip on camera? Huh, a front flip. Maybe. My student, Nick, he's really good at front flips. Um... Jordan Chow is really good at doing flippy things. Um, I'm pretty good at doing lateral flips, aerials. Front flips, not my strength, but I'm working on it. So, uh, yeah, I love gymnastics movement. And I would recommend any serious fighter get serious about gymnastics movement. Like all the great wrestlers that I know uh, are also very serious about gymnastics movement. If you look at uh, Ricky Lundell and the way he coaches wrestling over Bishop Gorman, uh, man... Ricky Lendell, I think he's over in Las Vegas right now. He is huge, huge on, on gymnastics training because that amplifies your wrestling. It makes you a better fighter. It makes you a much, much better athlete. It increases your bodily kinesthetic intelligence. But yeah, learn those flips. Yeah, Yoel Romero is a perfect example of how um, gymnastics training can turn you into an absolute monster in a fight. You know, physically, kinesthetically, um, mentally, and so on. I mean, if you're not afraid to do backflips and roundoffs and all these other movements, man, that, that's huge. That's huge. Saw a question about the 12 to 6 elbow, but it skipped by, man. I wanted to answer that one.
All right, guys, looks like I've got to go right now. Thank you so much for the questions. If you have any other questions, please leave them in the comments down below. We'll do another one of these live streams as soon as I can, since I'm stuck at home because of the coronavirus right now. Um, and this quarantine throughout the city. I'll probably make one sooner than later because I got some time to kill these days. Thanks for watching. Get out there and train.